So I'm pleased to present Laura Paskus. She's one of our two keynotes at our science symposium this year. She's a longtime environmental reporter based here in Albuquerque. Um, currently, she's the um, environmental reporter for the New Mexico PBS and produces the monthly series, Our Land, New Mexico's Environmental Past, Present, and Future. Um, this year, she's also working in collaboration with Frontline on an, an investigation into the military's contamination of groundwater. Um, her book, At the Precipice, New Mexico's Changing Climate, was published in September this past year, this year of by the University of New Mexico Press. Um, she's been a journalist since 2002 when she began her career at High County News. She's also worked as managing editor for the Tribal College Journal, um, a publication of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium as a reporter and producer for KUNM-FM in Albuquerque, and as the environment reporter for New Mexico Political Report. She is freelance for local, regional, and national publications. She's a board member for the Society of Environmental Journalists and formerly served as president of the Rio Grande chapter of the Society for Professional Journalists. All right, so Laura, you have 30 minutes. Hi everyone, um, working from home like everybody else, just so you know, animals and people may likely walk through. So uh, thanks for your patience. Um, so thank you for including me in today's program or this week's program. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and I admire the work that so many of you do. Um, and so many of you, as I'm looking through the names, so many of you have been sources for me over the years and I appreciate your willingness to talk with me and to help me learn about your research. And for some of you, um, a couple of you in particular, Thank you for your willingness to answer the same questions over and over and over again. And repetition is one of the things that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. But um, yeah, it's really nice to see all of your names and I wish that I could see all of your faces. But um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about communicating scientific information to different audiences. So Debbie, thanks for the introduction. Um, just to back up a little bit, I've been a journalist since 2002, and I came to journalism from archaeology and tribal consultation. So from, you know, sort of the private consultation world. And um, those were really interesting jobs that I liked for various reasons, um, mostly because of field work, which I'm sure many of you can relate to. Um, but one of the things that I found really infuriating about the consulting world was I was learning about all of this really interesting stuff, whether it was energy policy and pipelines or water policy and dams and water management or things like cultural resources or the loss of lands or drought and adaptation. You know, I was learning about all these really great things and sometimes I would write up a report that would be submitted to a federal or state agency that would maybe be read by four people. Um, so that was, you know, really, it was very interesting, but I didn't feel like I was really um, helping the public in any way, which is kind of a weird thing to think about because jobs like that are really funded by taxpayer money and the knowledge that you're gaining is funded by taxpayer money and yet the public doesn't really understand so many of these things that are happening um and that's for good or bad right the, the public isn't getting access to all this great scientific information and all these sorts of exciting things that are being researched or understood and they're also maybe not necessarily understanding some of the bad things that are happening you know how energy policy might be affecting their health or their futures or landscapes or future water resources and things like that so um moving from working in the consulting world to journalism was a really good step for me because I could still keep learning about all of these really interesting things, but instead of writing up a report that like four people read, you know, maybe I would write a story that maybe 50 people or 100 people were read, um, would read. And at the same time, as a journalist, as um, proxy for the public, it's my job to ask people in positions of power or in positions of decision making questions that everyone could hear the answers to and everyone could gain a broader understanding of what's happening so um 
if you are familiar with my work, you know that I basically stuck to a few key issues over almost two decades. So um, those are the those are the issues that I think are most important. You know, there's all sorts of reporters out there in the world. Um, some of whom work for daily newspapers who have a particular beat, and they have to keep um, they have to keep you know covering the city council or covering business or whatever. And and I've been fortunate enough throughout my career that that I have figured out a way to continue to report on the issues that I'm most interested in, whether that's the Middle Rio Grande and things like the Silvery Minnow and water management, or energy policy in the state or climate change, um, or most recently the issue of PFAS contamination at military bases. Um, so I definitely have had a certain luxury in my career to really just hone in on particular issues that I think are really interesting, which I think maybe I've learned some things that might be useful to scientists like yourselves, um, to be able to communicate about the issues that you think are important. Um, so the big hang, so we, ha we all have these, these issues that we think are most important, whether it's as a journalist or as a researcher. Um, and so kind of the, the hang up is how do you get that information in front of the public? And that's definitely changed over just the course of my career. When I first started at High Country News, we were a bi-weekly newspaper, like still looked like a newspaper that you would unfold and open up like a broadsheet kind of. Um, and then we got a website. And now of course the internet is how the vast majority of people get their news. And I've even seen that change over time. Whereas kind of you, ha you had your, your print news story and there would be things that would be supplemental online. The analogy for y'all might be you have your academic paper and then there's your, your supplemental data or supplemental information. Um, and then it was kind of like everybody was getting their news from going directly to a particular news site's page. Like you would go to the New York Times every morning and read the New York Times online. And now, of course, people seem to get the vast majority of their information through social media. So their access to news is oftentimes curated by the people they follow or the algorithms that uh, choose what we're each going to see. And it's, it's, um, it's simultaneously super frustrating and annoying that that's how we all get our news and it's also kind of exciting and interesting and presents some new ways of thinking about who um, you know who gets to tell the story does the reporter tell the story or does the person who holds the story tell the story so um, I've kind of joked but it's true that I will basically do anything to get these issues that I think are important in front of audiences. So I've worked in print, I've worked online, I've worked in radio and television. And, you know, now for better or for worse, social media is a huge part of how we get issues and news in front of people. So kind of thinking about what I try to do in communicating science, I came up with a few different ideas for scientists to be conveying their work to the public, which I think is really important, not just for your own careers and your own, um, you know, sort of benefit of getting that information from the public, but because the public deserves to understand what you're doing. So. One of the big things is to consider your audience and your goals, if you have specific goals. Like, what is it that you want the public or your audience to understand? And, and being really clear about who that is and what you want them to understand once you're done talking or writing or communicating. And the second thing that's really important is repetition, which can be a challenge 
in journalism because, you know, when I have worked for one news outlet at a time or freelanced for one particular news outlet regularly, you know, I would kind of come every summer and be like, the Rio Grande has dried. This is an important story. And they're like, well, you did a story last year about the Rio Grande drying. Um, what's new about it this year? And so in the news business, that can be infuriating and frustrating because these, just because it's not new or news doesn't mean the public shouldn't understand what's happening or shouldn't know what's happening. And I think that this, um, this lesson is, translates into scientific communication as well. Like you just have to repeat things over and over and over again for your audiences. You, you have to repeat those things over and over again, come up with different ways of saying them until it really kind of cements in the minds of the public and of decision makers and of policy makers. Um, for example, if New Mexico state legislators don't understand the importance of say water planning in New Mexico and why they should be allocating funding toward water planning in New Mexico, when that 30 or 60 day session rolls around each year, if they're not hearing from constituents, they're just not going to be thinking about water planning. So that's just one example, that those issues need to be in front of people all of the time for that information to really sink in. It's like those, um, you know, the commercials with the terrible jingles that you see in here over and over again until you're driven insane. Um, you know, we don't wanna drive anyone insane, but we do want things like smart water policy and water planning or um, good energy policy or thoughtful endangered species management, like you want those things at the top of people's minds. So repetition is really important. Um, one of the things that I think is maybe challenging sometimes in communicating science is you're really excited, you're really focused on your research and that's super important and you need to do that, but you also need to be a person about it. Um, and this goes for agencies, I think, as well, when communicating to the public. Um, it really helps to have, um, it helps for people who are being swamped with so many different types of information to really have a character in their minds, to have a person who is associated with that issue or that research. Um, it's, you know, like just for example, if you think about social media, if you're scrolling through Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and somebody just shares the, the title of a study and a link, and you kind of leave it up to your audience to figure things out for themselves, not very many people who aren't already interested and already know about that topic are going to are gonna click on that and keep exploring. So you need to give your audience a reason beyond their existing interest in the topic to kind of follow along with you on your journey there. And this, I wanna just mention this because this is especially like putting yourself out there with your research, I think is especially important for women and people of color um, for years and years, when it came to journalism or different issues, for years and years when people would ask me to be on a panel or give a talk, I would always, you know, sort of say like, no, I don't, you know, oh, there's somebody else who's better to talk about that or, you know, for whatever reason, I'm like super shy and introverted and actually really do not like talking to audiences, even scary Zoom audiences. And so, you know, it was easy to say no to things, even though I felt like I had things to say or things to contribute. And I had a fellow journalist, Megan Kamrick, whose voice you might recognize from KUNM, point out to me that what it means when women say no to invitations, it means you're saying, I'm not an expert, 
find somebody else who's better and smarter than me. And I think when it comes to communicating your, your science to the public or your colleagues, I think it's especially important for women and people of color to say yes to those invitations, even when it's personally challenging to do so. And I think this is especially important for scientists for a couple of reasons, including the public needs to understand that science is done by all sorts of people. And young people especially need role models. So I think kind of my, my main point in this is, is that you have to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and say yes, even when maybe you don't necessarily want to. Um, the other reason you should say yes is nobody loves your topic or your research like you love your topic or your research. And so you're always going to be the best person to talk about it. Um, you know, Oftentimes, what's happened over the past, I mean, it happened throughout the Bush administration, as well as Obama, and certainly through the Trump administration, work for an agency, and you've spent your career or many years working on a particular project or in a particular line of study, when a journalist or anybody wants to talk with you about your research, um, please try very hard to resist the tendency of agencies to not let you talk to journalists. Um, you know, oftentimes, I think it happens more with agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency. Certainly here in New Mexico, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation has been really um, stellar, ab above, has gone above and beyond most federal agencies that I deal with in terms of allowing access to scientists and experts. But um, you know your research better than anybody and you are the best person to talk about your research. Oftentimes, scientific research gets filtered and squished through the public affairs um, portal and you lose out because you're not able to communicate your passion and your work. And certainly the public loses out because they're not able to to understand the issues through your lens. Um, another thing is in terms of comfort zones even, to if you wanna be communicating about your science, that really means you're gonna to have to work across platforms. If you truly wanna get this information in front of more people, um, publishing a peer reviewed report or publishing a white paper just, it's not enough to get that information in front of the public. It's a really key and important part, but to communicate to the public in effective ways, it really means going out of your comfort zone and working across platforms. And that can be anything from talking to journalists to um, you know, sort of boosting your work and presence on social media. I've watched a really, and many of you likely have too, watched a really interesting debate play out on Twitter over the last couple of years, where you have kind of older sort of tenure track um, academics who have um, kind of poo-pooed the use of social media by, by graduate students and, and younger professors um, as sort of like being on social media is unprofessional or something like that. Um, and instead, what I see happening is you see people um, in the scientific community who are using their social media platforms to do a number of things, to um, share their work and share their expertise on the issues that they work on, and also building up a following that is interested in the issue, learning more about the issue, and kind of becoming like, you know, these sort of dedicated social media followers to these fields of study and to these people. And a couple, I have like a few people who I think have done a really excellent job of this to kind of mix their, their science with their, their personalities and have done really great public service, I think, in terms of raising the profile of their research and the issues that are important to them. So one of those is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, 
the climate scientist at Texas Tech University. And she really blends her scientific expertise with um, a lot of savviness around policy and also religion which is an important part of her life. Um, many of you probably know Michael Thomas Bogan at the University of Arizona, who works with the Desert Fishes Council. He does an awesome job of sharing not just his research and the research of his students online, but also you know pictures of um, the Santa Cruz River and that whole journey of um, of um, how that habitat has been recovering as Tucson has been adding effluent into the river there and kind of bringing a, a part of that river back. And then Erin McGee at the University of Arizona, who some of you might know as Afro Herper, she's done an awesome job of raising profile of the species that she works on and kind of building excitement around science and science communication. Um, one other person, a science writer, who I think is, is really great at this is Ed Young, who writes for The Atlantic, who is an amazing writer who covers these super complex topics um, and sort of translates science into um, something that's useful and readable to the public. And also it's like this very gracious, um, sort of uh, gracious, funny, of personality on social media. So I kind of want to pause right here because I am curious if you have any questions or, um, yeah, if you have any questions. Um, so we did learn uh, yesterday that people type slower than they can talk. So um, I haven't seen any questions come in yet on this topic, um, but I did want to ask you, Laura, uh, we spent a lot of time um, in the program talking about how to be better science communicators about the science we are doing internally in the program and in our own agencies. But how can we best um, communicate, not just in, among scientists in our own field, but between scientific fields and also um, to policymakers and decision makers? That's a great question. So I think that, um, communicating across kind of across various platforms and kind of um, kind of um, doing that is important here in New Mexico I think we have a really unique opportunity in in dealing not dealing with but in building relationships with the state legislator legislators for example it is a citizen, legislature and although there are people like Melanie Sansbury who's like just amazing you know understands water policy and management so many legislators don't and it's you know it's no knock on them they have all their other issues that they're experts on and these legislators in New Mexico are so accessible and it's really easy to call them up and set up a meeting I guess virtually nowadays to reach out to these people and help them understand your research and why it's important. Um, I think that's one of the kind of the, the best ways for scientists, especially people working on something as important as the middle Rio Grande and in all of its various issues, um, reaching out to those legislators in formal ways or informal ways and really helping them understand the issues and why they're important and why they merit the attention of legislators. The same thing goes for the um, staff and um, you know, policy type folks with the city of Albuquerque. These are really bright people who care about these issues and, and wanna know more. And I think maybe just kind of taking that chance and reaching out to a legislator or a public official who you think can have real impact on the issues you cover and helping them understand your research and what it has to do with their constituencies. I also, I just wanted to mention really briefly one thing about communicating uncertainty, which is something that Debbie had brought up 
And I know that you all know this, but to, to all of you, uncertainty means something totally different from what it means to non-scientists. And I understand the importance of uncertainty and acknowledging it in your work and um, continuing to acknowledge that in your work. But I just want to mention when you're talking to the, the public or a journalist or a legislator or policymaker, I just have a little bit of advice. Like, don't lead with the uncertainty. Lead with what you do know and what you are clear about and what, why that has meaning and, and purpose. Um, and find ways of explaining that uncertainty. Um, that would be meaningful to like your parent or your child or a neighbor before you talk about it with somebody, you know, kind of member of the public or reporter or policymaker, like practice that. And then the third thing, which I know you all know, but don't let anyone exploit the uncertainty that you have in your studies. Um, you know, there are, there are always going to be forces out there that want to cast doubt on scientific research and the scientific method and the work that you're doing. And so be very protective of that. We do have some questions coming in. Um, Grace Haggerty from the ISC asks, do you think COVID has prepped the public to be more in tune to science information? And if so, perhaps we should take advantage of that interest. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. And hi, Grace. Um, I, I, I feel both ways about that. On the one hand, I think COVID has shown us that there is a particular portion of the population that is is, is antagonistic toward scientists and the scientific method and the important work that scientists do. Um, but I do, I think you're right that, um, that this is a time when people are paying better attention to the experts and looking to the experts for guidance. And so um, I think that there, there are ways for you all to kind of amplify the work that you're doing by being like, uh, you know, this, we, we all follow the same methods and have sort of the same um, standards, even if we're working on different types of issues, whether it's the co it's COVID or water management. And so I think this is a really interesting time in history to be thinking about that. Great. Um, we have a, Kath, a question from Catherine Murphy, our science coordinator um, with the program. What do you think is the biggest obstacle to effective science communication with the public? Boy, that's a really good question. I think part of it is there's so much noise out there. And like right now, people are just at capacity. Um, you know, kind of paying attention to our our traffic at New Mexico PBS and the, the specifically the stories that we do on the environment. Um, we've we've or I've seen traffic just drop off. Um, people are so focused on COVID and until recently so focused on the election, it's like they didn't have the mental capacity to think about um really anything else serious um and we've seen that with our reporting partners um i was talking with some of the folks at frontline pbs and they've seen their traffic for for their documentaries that are also on youtube they've seen that traffic decline people are just so overwhelmed right now and so i think I know this is gonna sound terrible and I shouldn't even say this, but part of it is like, just like finding ways to connect with the audience and sort of pulling them in with like, hey, this is a picture of a cute porcupine, pay attention to this. And oh, here real quick, here's a story about PFAS and groundwater contamination. Could you look at that while you're looking at the porcupine picture? Um, and it's just really hard to get people's attention right now. So persistence and repetition, I think, are your two, your two keys to success. Right. Um, Grace has another question. What do you think the public is most interested in hearing when it comes to the Rio Grande? So I really think that New Mexicans 
I really, you know, New Mexicans have such a strong connection with their rivers and landscapes. And I think that, I think that in the middle Rio Grande Valley, people really want to understand how the river functions. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that, right? Because when you just see like one little stretch of river and you're not thinking about the big picture like you all are, um, it's easy to just not understand. So I think like, helping people understand how the Rio Grande works these days um, and what all those different factors are that are related to how the river flows. And um, I think that is really interesting to people. Um, I think they're definitely interested in the connections between the, the river and the, the bosque and the wildlife and the cottonwood forests for sure. And I also think that I think that one of the things that we can all do better, and I know I certainly would like to do better, is to help people understand the whole of the system better, rather than thinking about it so much in terms of mine and yours and upstream and downstream and different users, but thinking about it as a system as a whole that we're all a part of and we're all invested in seeing thrive. Right. Um, Becky Bixby from UNM um, says, inspiring chat. Um, there's a real push in the social science realm to have more bi-directional outreach. Um, this is termed public engagement in science rather than one directional outreach. So it's scientists talking with, not talking to the public. Can you give us your thoughts? I think that's a huge, a huge thing and really exciting and interesting because, you know, you all are the experts on your research, but the, so many people have other things to say and, and um, perspectives to offer um, that I think those conversations and community engagement are so exciting and, and I think that we all learn so much from that and I know it can be it can be challenging and it can be complicated and sometimes it can be really hard and a little bit painful but I think that on the whole it's a really valuable and exciting thing that I think is really exciting to see more of as we go forward <laughs> um, and I realize I've totally gone over time and I appreciate your attention. no that is fine I um Catherine's on the agenda after this and she said she, you can have as much of her time as you want this is a great conversation no, if anybody has any more questions, I'm happy to answer them, but um, I would love for you all to get back to the important work that you're doing and, and learning about one another's work. I really appreciate your, your time and your interest, and I look forward to seeing what you all um, are working on. Great. Well, thanks for the chat. Um, um, you didn't plug your book, so I will for you. Um, <laughs> At the Precipice, New Mexico's Changing Climate. It just came out. I'm reading it right now. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Bye, y'all. Thanks, Laura.